Hello, everybody. Apologies for being a minute late. I had a couple of things to do before I was ready for the stream. One was to make sure my compressor actually had some air in it, because you do not want to hear that go off midstream, because it's deafening. And also, I need to get some warm water. It's hot water at the moment, but it will cool. Um, for decals, or decals, as uh, different people seem not to understand that there are different pronunciations, different valid pronunciations of the word decal or decal. Hey John, hi Taggers, welcome to the stream. So today I am going to be carrying on from last time. I haven't actually progressed from last time. I thought I'd actually leave it until today. Obviously, Weekend is a fairly busy time. I went to see Oppenheimer last night, um, which I thoroughly recommend. It's a really good film. Probably not going to change your life, but it's certainly a good, solid piece of entertainment. And it doesn't feel like it's runtime of three hours long. So that's definitely worthwhile. The other thing to mention is that after this stream, I'll be going on to, uh, well, I will also be streaming from Man's Model Moments, um, the usual Monday night Ifix and Chill with Moss and crew. So I think John will be there. I think we've got Model Minutes, LPJ Models. Um, we've got Plastic Alchemist, um, James the Model Officer, and uh, probably one or two others that I've forgotten that were actually at the Creator Day. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the Creator Day, a bit about something that went into this kit and the production of it, the kind of history and you know, our experiences during that day and how they relate to the kit. Okay, that all out of the way. Um, I haven't actually taken any of the wash off that I put on uh, the last time on here. So I will be doing that today. So that has had a couple of days to dry. So some people may be wondering, well, is that too long? And the answer is not necessarily oil-based washes anything in an organic solvent like mineral spirits or white spirit can be removed by adding a little bit just moistening i say moistening not wetting um either one of these makeup removers or a cotton bud q-tip american and just going over um, I did want my wash to stain the underlying acrylic a little bit, just to give it that worn look a little bit. Obviously, the least amount of time that your wash is in contact with your surface, the less of that effect you're going to get. Um, but if you stain down and then lift off, you get a good control over what's actually left on the model. The other thing I will mention, especially for people who are going to be watching this after, um, in the recorded version of this, you'll probably notice that the maximum resolution is going to be 720. Now that is down to StreamYard. Uh, we'll only export. Uh, we won't go to 1080 unless you get not the paid version, but the professional version, which is super expensive. Um, so like five or six hundred dollars a year, I think. And I don't do enough streaming at the moment for that, and I'm kind of don't want to go down the stream yard. I want to commit to the stream yard route because I think I'm exploring other options. I think OBS is probably the way to go, but I need to change my setup here a little bit before I can do that. So apologies. It's also the YouTube compression algorithm, which also takes that base footage and compresses it down. So the resolution won't be that great for detail shots. So I apologize in advance for that. Um, so just take it that I'm going to be looking at the more the overview and I'm going to be building more today. So all of those caveats aside, let's uh, crack on and get on to removing some of this wash. So again, I'm going to be using some of my odorless mineral spirits. I'm just going to put a little bit in the lid there. As I said, these little makeup removers, they're really soft. I'm just going to moisten that. So literally, just um, there's not even liquid in here. I'm just moistening it just to get a little bit of that on. These do tend to degrade when you've got organic solvent in them. So 
we won't use that much, but hopefully you can see here as I'm doing that, it is removing quite a lot of that, that wash. So you can see how much is coming off from that, even though it's just moistened, and even though this has been on for a couple of days now. So it's very much on the model, but very easy to get off if you know what you're doing. And with not a, a huge amount of effort. So I'm mainly trying to make sure I'm taking it off this wash, taking it off on the, the main areas, sort of big, wide, empty areas. And I'm not going to go too hard where you've got rivets, where you've got the breast areas that would be those areas that collect dirt and shadows. Again, remember we are creating the illusion of depth not trying to faithfully reproduce exactly what this would like at one to one scale because that's not how models work. Now you see there, I put a little bit too much on. So I'll swap to the other side. Again, how much of this you will actually see? Probably not that much. Oh, Revell versus Airfix, eh? Unfortunately, I am not familiar with either of the 172nd kits. And good evening, Plastic Alchemist. Uh, I do have the Airfix 172nd kit, but I have not as yet started it. And as I said last time, pretty far down on my on my list. Um, after the Seeking, which wasn't a planned build of mine, uh, before the Creator Day, I have the ICM Ghost of Kiev. That video should be out this week. Well, it will be out this week. Um, I just need to take the final shots. It's all complete. Um, so that is digital camouflage. Let's take this seat out. And, okay, maybe I won't, because that's really in. And you can see I have just broken the control color. It shows you how delicate these are. So, I'll take it off. I'll glue all of those back. Probably my own fault from choosing it to do it this way. But I always prefer to put pieces in place like this and then paint them all in place because I find if you do the other way around, sometimes it's problematic to integrate them all back. Ah, so the Revel one is better. Um, why exactly is the Airfix one better? Oh, sorry, is the Revel one better than the, the Airfix? Is it detailed, the way it goes together? Uh, taggers, yes, indeed. I do have both allocation for a second-hand stroke, vintage stroke, rare kit section in the shop. And I also have stock for that already so they include some pretty old kits um i think i've shown a couple of them actually on airfix and chill uh one of which was the revel Oof. it's a revel ship i can't remember <laughs> okay so i think actually i'm done with taking off the wash there so you can see the lighter areas lighter airbrushed areas in the center of these panels still showing through and i've still got the contrast from the, the wash 
little dark areas here around the rivets and so on. How much stock has come from Moss? Um, I've only actually bought three kits from Moss. So not too bad. Now, do I put any of those in the shop? Um, the signed mosquito is definitely going in the shop. So I think that's quite a nice little sort of showpiece. Um, if anybody wants to buy it, they can. But um, it's not going to be kind of there for that, if you like. It's just a, like a nice little conversation piece for people if they want to chat. Sorry. Looking through comments at the moment. So is the fit on the um, one seventy second FX seeking problematic, or is it just that the Revell one is is better? Because the FX kit is a pretty recent tooling, isn't it? Hello, Ollie. Welcome to the stream. So I will be putting the decals, stroke decals, on things like this radar screen and the control panel um, shortly. Not that there is that much to show with the fix decals because of course they are cartograph and I have found them to be pretty excellent. I haven't had any any problems at all with recent airfix cartograph decals. Ah Ollie you're the one that's finished the Ravel seeking we were just wondering how exactly it's better than the the airfix one so if the airfix one is 2015 i wonder then if it is because it usually takes a couple of years at least a year to develop a a, a tooling I wonder if it's still sort of a vestige of um, the last management, if you like. Although, I must admit, anything from sort of 2010 onwards, last sort of 15 years or so with Airfix, I must say it's been pretty good. So I don't know whether... I know the attitude and the kind of approach with uh, Hornby taking over is very different. And certainly the way they design kits, as we will, uh, if you're on Airfix and Chill in a little while, uh, you shall find out. Okay, I think we are just about there with all of these. So there's a couple of things I want to do before I start putting all of these pieces together. One is move them all out of the way. These pieces can stay across there. 
because I want to spray up the blue on the inside, the external blue colour, uh, which is on the inside here. So, in terms of the colour, it is a fairly dark blue, but I'm not too worried about the exact shade of the interior. So I probably want it to be a little bit lighter anyway, so that it doesn't darken the inside and prevent people looking in a little bit. So I think the uh, this intense blue from Vallejo is what I'm going to go with. I can actually get my airbrush open. So using um, Ultimate Airbrush Thinner uh, from Ultimate Modeling Products. I use this most of my acrylic spraying so it just i have found it pretty good um the only thing i don't use it for really is for tamir where i actually just use water and alcohol not ipa but actually ethanol Um, in Europe, I don't know about in the rest of uh, the world, you can get uh, these kind of bottles uh, of alcohol. So it's basically 96%, you know, but um, these you get at pharmacists for a few euros. You can't get this in the UK because we charge duty on alcohol, so it doesn't matter what it's used for, uh, it just becomes enormously expensive. Okay. Alrighty, let's... Uh... I might actually just mute my microphone during this because I doubt you want to hear air being blasted out. So, yes, let's not say any more on that front. So, as I say, this is a this is a little bit lighter than it's actually going to be on the outside. Although I might start with a base of this because if I um, wash down from this um, and then shade up from it, maybe. Not sure. I haven't decided exactly what shade I'm going to do the outside yet. How I'm going to approach that. One of the things I think I am going to do, because these are recessed rivets, and obviously on the real thing, uh, they are raised rivets, uh, albeit 
in this scale, I think I mentioned on the unboxing video, it'd be about 0.1 millimeters. So it'd be very, very subtle, um, but obviously very difficult to restore stuff if you've got a join that you need to sand. Um, I think what I'm going to do with these is actually do a lighter wash so that anything going in the, the rivets will be a lighter shade than the base coat, just to simulate that um, light hitting preferentially on the rivets. So I think that's what I'm going to do. We'll see, see how that actually turns out. Uh, this, of course, will dry darker as well. Blue looks here. So once I've taken off these, we'll move on to instrument decals. I can actually get a hold of this little piece. It's proving quite difficult. As always with these things, if you're trying to show somebody else, it's always much more difficult than if you're just doing it yourself. So after the Ghost of Kiev is um, is up this week, uh, I also have the ICM 148 scale Beaufort. That's also being built at the moment. At the moment I'm just waiting for some paints for that. So ICM have actually sent me over the uh, RAF um, bomber and uh, bomber crew paints for that. Also, it's going to be a bomber crew that they have. So I want to make sure that uh, those arrive so I can do the whole of that uh, review both at the same time. A um, couple of other things I have. I've kind of got a bit of res a reserve at the moment. I have the the return of the one hour challenge I mentioned in the F35 um, starter kit, the FX starter kit um, review, that I thought it was such a simple build that I could probably build it as a starter set challenge in an hour. So I did that. I, I put my money where my mouth was and uh, attempted that. So I have that video uh, to go up at some point in the next uh, couple of weeks as well. Okay. So you'll have to uh, join me for that one if you want to see whether I actually manage that. A big auction item up on the next stream. Um, I actually got in a job lot for the shop, for the kind of second-hand section. And um, so I've been buying some some job lots with a, a kind of half mind to the shop. Um, and then obviously a lot of job lots come with that partially started kits and things. So I've been looking for a kind of a balance of you know, things that I could do and things that could work for the shop. And there was a 132nd scale Supermarine Spitfire from Matchbox Mark 22, um, which is a pretty rare kit these days. It is complete, has all its decals and instructions and everything. So I might, might just uh, auction that one at some point in the near future. But coming back 
to the Sea King. I am not going to do the radar on because this is not going to be flying. So I will be using the off version of the big radar. And then what have I got? There's two little screens somewhere here. Um, I won't be using the little map of the UK. So that will go in the spares for another time. Oh, I think they're over here. Yeah. And then these are decals for depending on which version um, of the Sea King is which decal goes on. These, I think, I am number one. Indeed, number one. So, number one, we have this off version of number seven. There isn't a lot of room to cut between those. And what else do we have decal wise? Number two, yellow, that's interesting. And I think that is pretty much it for the time being. Don't think we have any others to put on right now. Four and five, where did I go? Ah, here we go. So I'm using five, which is this one here, which is the one that goes on this top piece of the control panel. Yeah, I guess it's where they get their decals printed, right? I mean, Cartograph, obviously, you know, have got their, their S together because these the registration on these is absolutely perfect. Um, but I'm guessing the investment to print decals like this is fairly substantial. So if you're a smaller company, um, or even a larger company which has invested you know in the past a lot of money on producing you know a decal creation machine a decal printing machine um that you know the registration well let's say you can remove any registration issues on things like roundels then you know are you going to re-spend the money to reinvest in you know tens of thousands of pounds on something when you've already solved the problem? Maybe not. So now somewhere around here, I have my trusty bottle of pledge, a trusty decanted bottle of pledge because I have a big bottle of it. But I had it the other day, which is always a dangerous thing because it probably means I've moved it somewhere to be quote unquote safe. And then immediately forgotten where I put it. Right. Oh, blue's not bad. I don't think I'm going to do anything more than that with this because I don't really think you're going to see any of that. It's just going to be background 
two other pieces. So I'm going to leave that to one side for this to fully dry. And where, oh, where has my pledge bottle gone? For some reason, I put it on the floor. Here we go. Ooh, needs need topping up soon. So, for those of you who don't know what pledge is, uh, this is originally Johnson's Clear with a K. Um, so I see Johnson made clear, which was adopted by the modeling community as a really good gloss varnish and decal solution. Um, now, a lot of people say, oh, you can use any gloss varnish. And that's not true because of the chemical composition of this. They use a couple of things, basically um, a plasticizer, um, which is basically a, an organic um, solvent that acts like um, microsol effectively um, the same kind of solvents although you know if you use ipa or something that's much harsher so the ones in this seem to um, seem to soften things without actually you know causing any disruption and certainly doesn't lift paint or anything um, and also because it's quite sticky i think um, in a molecular sense um, so it really beds them down. Um, so I've used this. Um, so it was Johnson's Clear, then uh, Future, Johnson's Future, and then Pledge with Future Shine. Unfortunately, SC Johnson discontinued it in 2022. So if you can pick up a bottle of it anywhere, I would recommend you do so. Uh, just see if I can find a bottle. Uh. No, not off the top of my head. Uh, if I can find it later, I'll, I'll show you it. But they come in a big bottle, you know, kind of. Uh, oh, what is it? 500 mils, maybe 750 mils, something like that. So one bottle will last you forever if you can find it. But it's not available from SC Johnson. You might find it in shops and things. Um, but you're not going to get it direct from the manufacturer. I have been looking at alternatives. I've ruled a couple of out. I found one that might fit the bill. And basically, the things that I'm looking at is there is a site which tells you the chemical composition, or not the chemical composition, but all of the chemicals in um, household ingredients. And because I know a little bit about chemistry, I can look at these various things and look for alternatives, like products that also contain those. They also contain other things. Nothing is the same, obviously. Um, and I have found one. Now, not only does it need to contain the same kind of things and do the same sort of job, but it also has to fulfill two other criteria, which means that a lot of things get thrown out the window. One is that it has to be pretty cheap, because otherwise you might as well just buy dedicated modeling supplies, which are always going to be more expensive, um, but obviously purpose made and tailored for that job. Um, and it has to be readily available, right? It has to be common because getting a a single you know source like if it was only available in the UK that's not really a good recommendation for me to make. It'd be great for people in the UK, but for everybody else it kind of screws them. So I think I'm onto something with one product. Um, I just need to do a couple more tests and then I'll I'll get a video out and I've recorded a lot of the stuff that I've done with it. So hopefully in the next um, month or so I can give you an update on that. So let's uh, stop waffling and get on with putting these decals on. So the way that I do decals, so everybody does decals in their own way, this is the way I always do them, is I always gloss coat the surface that I'm using. So I'm just using this pledge. that's one thing. And the reason you use a gloss coat, of course, um, putting decals or decals down is that if you look 
at any surface at a small enough level. <laughs> so if you look at the microscopic level, um, what seems like a smooth surface isn't, of course. But matte paint basically has micro texture. So it's, it's essentially you know, like a lot of little jagged bits. It's like a, a big, you know, fairly porous, fairly uh, irregular surface. And a gloss surface, of course, is smoother. And the reason they're called silver and uh, don't go down well is well, one of the reasons. Uh, silvering is usually caused by air trapped between the decal and the, the surface um, on a very small scale, um, creating that mirror effect of silvering, which makes it very noticeable and doesn't make them look painted on. So anything that can smooth that surface to allow the decal to actually go and sit and adhere onto the surface. And of course, things like micro sol uh, then help in confirmation of the decal. So pulling the decal down into the detail. So what you're actually doing is kind of softening. I mentioned that plasticizer chemical before. You're softening the structure of it and then pulling it down into the detail as it dries. So that helps obviously get rid of air and also confirmation. Um, and then, of course, you can... Again, the reason I like Pledge is that Pledge dissolves itself and um, along with Windex, which is the kind of thing that you use to clean out anything with ammonia. So once you put another coat on, effectively, you're almost like embedding the decal within a kind of coat top and bottom of, uh, of this Pledge Clear, maybe you want to call it Future, uh, which of course then eliminates any possibility of air getting in and gives you that really painted on look. And then you can put whatever finish you like on top of that. So if you want a matte finish, um, I often use uh, this Army Painter Anti-Shine. So if you do just a, a light coat of this, it actually comes out kind of a semi-gloss. Um, and then if you go heavy on it, it comes out more matte. Or if you want a really matte coat, I will use Winsor & Newton Ryla Artist Matte Varnish, which is a white spirit um, based matte varnish. It dries super, super matte. Hello, Zinzan. So, you just uh, put a little edge on these just to, to gloss coat them. Only doing the areas, obviously, that uh, I'm actually going to put decals on, because I'm not a masochist. Although, if you've seen the F30, FX F35 video where I masked all of the RAM tape, you may think otherwise. Okay, let's get these... Uh... Decals in. So usually I'll soak decals in warm water and then just leave them on the on the side for that water to actually act on the adhesive. Because I find it if you put them on the water and then forget about them, they'll just float off. It's much harder usually to retrieve a decal that is floating about in your bowl than it is to deal with it uh, like this. Okay. So usually what I do decals is I usually use a, just a, a regular paintbrush. I actually find these, these Humbrol kind of number one, number two size are actually pretty convenient for most of these. So I've just got it on the brush there. And then that allows pretty easy placement.
where I need it. For these cartograph decals, I find that you can get away with using a scalpel to move it around. But usually I use a combination of my scalpel and brush. Some decals won't allow you to do that. They're not sort of robust enough. They'll end up tearing. So you need to, to check. Your mileage may vary. I'm not exactly sure what coverage these are supposed to actually get. Again, nobody's going to ever see this, but um, that doesn't stop us knowing about it. So once the decal's on, and then we'll put it another coat of pledge on quite a lot quite often i'll actually put one underneath the decal as well again so you kind of got that almost embedding okay let that uh that dry Uh, sometimes with larger decals, I'll use a larger brush, something like a large flat brush, something more like this. It just gives you a better chance of getting the, the entire decal off in one, like so. Make sure I've got the right alignment here. Now, I almost never use sol uh, solvent solutions on decals. And that is because, firstly, Pledge does work in 99% of uh, the situations. So this is a little tricky, this one here. Just the side, just a little piece. Um, instrument panels are often the ones which I do. So certainly I'm going to put uh, some more pledge on this before I put the decal on the main instrument panel because it's a very large decal. Now when I do use solutions, I never use microset. I think it's a complete waste of time. Um, I know some people swear by it, but it's basically just diluted vinegar. Um, but microsol, you can also make your own if you uh, take something like, for instance, Tamiya Extra Thin, uh, and put that in a solution of IPA and water. Uh, that basically does the same kind of thing. So for very large decals like this, I'll usually get them in position and slide them off just on the go like that. I hope that my finger is not going to keep them stuck there. And I've just managed to take the decal off. The panel. I'm just going to put back on the backing paper <laughs> whilst I do this large one, I think. So it really does depend on how this reacts. So I know when I did the instrument panel on the 148 scale Airfix Blenheim, uh, I did need a little bit of solvent just to, to really suck it down into the detail. 
get it soft enough. But these cartograph decals are very thin, but pretty robust. So I usually like to see how they react before I start messing with any solvent. Uh, and it gives a good effect. It's looking pretty nice. Again, I won't show it up to the camera because of the limitations on the StreamYard resolution and YouTube. But obviously, on the main video review of this, when that goes up, that'll all be in 1080p. So you'll be able to see the detail on all of these. Just another reason to watch the video rather than the only try and shortcut things with the live stream. That's, that's my excuse. Yep, I know some people swear by microset. Um, I just don't. <laughs> Not that it's a bad product. It's just a bit like selling tap water. It's nothing that you can't do yourself, create yourself. Um, so why would I pay three pounds for a small bottle of diluted vinegar? Maybe that's just a tight arse in me. I do have a bottle of Microset and Microsol, uh, which I actually bought for the express purpose of testing them. Uh, obviously on the channel I do have a video on, on all of this. Um, I have no idea where they are even. <laughs> okay, so those are all on. And actually, I have to say, they look pretty good. Obviously, they're not conformed to the surface properly yet because they're still, still drying. But they look like they're going to give a pretty good effect. And again, not that you will see a huge amount of this through the uh, cockpit window or the other pieces, but um, again, we will know. Let's see if I can use the larger brush that's deck on. So this is the big radar screen. You could just as easily paint this, but this is quite nice because painting, of course, relies on your skill at painting circles, which is not always the easiest thing to do, even when you've got a rim like you have here. This sort of just takes all the skill in painting out. Of course, if you find painting easier than positioning decals, then probably just paint it. Use a bit more of that uh, wedge underneath, which effectively does the same job um, as micro set in terms of positioning, you know, helping you position it. It's a, it's a layer of liquid to help float the, the decal into position to where you want it. And it also helps to, to pull it down. And because it has those plasticizers and binders in it, it'll help to secure it into position. Light issue is that lip is just preventing me getting that absolutely smooth. And we don't want to crease on a radar screen because that would look weird. Yeah, there we go. New air trapped under there. On radar screen. Yeah, I, I know I feel your pains in them. Um so when I was doing the ghost of Kiev, um the ICM kit, those 
Um, I don't know who ICM get, whether they print them themselves, which is possible, or somebody else does it. They're certainly not cartographed decals, and they did have a tendency, the smaller ones, just the edges to fold in on themselves, and they were almost impossible to unfold when they when they when they did that. I find the cartograph decals actually are pretty recoverable. Um, I haven't managed to completely destroy a set of these yet. I don't think. Fingers crossed. Um, saying that, obviously, I don't want to immediate invite disaster. Okay, so. That all aside and done, we can actually move on back to our fuselage floor. And we can actually, I'm just going to put my main camera on here, just so I capture this whole video. Okay. One of the things with streaming, of course, is I'm not going to use this webcam feed uh, with its limited resolution for the main video, so I do need to use my SLR to capture uh, this from my usual top-down angle. I just need to remember to do it. <laughs> because, as always, you get to the end of a build, and um, I think if any YouTuber, any modelling YouTuber is out there, um, can attest to you get hours and hours and hours of footage um, from a build so i record everything on my builds all the way through and then scour through that for the shots that i want um, inevitably you come to a point where you think i thought i had recorded x and you haven't so <laughs> the point that you had to, that you were going to make you can no longer make with the uh, intended shots because they don't exist and you can't of course go back and rebuild something once it's already built so if in my videos you ever see you know skip about to uh, to different things and you think why on earth is he doing this that's probably why because i've forgotten to record a piece somewhere So the pieces I broke before are going to leave right to the last minute here. Meanwhile, these larger assemblies. So this is the main dipping sonar. Which goes in place in this centerpiece. So I deliberately drilled one of these holes very snug so that it seats and I will because these are drilled all the way through I'm actually going to glue it from underneath to try and minimize the amount of glue and discoloration to any of the floor that I painted We have this little uh, set of shelves by the front door, let's call it, the main entrance. Again, I'm going to glue that from underneath. Again. Now, I don't think that's going to hold everything, so I'm actually going to glue it back here. <laughs> try and get this so you can actually see um, from back here because you will not see this because it's right next to the door on the other side so if there's any if I end up lifting paint or anything here it won't be noticeable this piece also locks down onto the dipping sonar so you have to put the dipping sonar in first before you put the set of shelves because otherwise you'll scupper yourself
Oops, starting to get the. It probably is where they keep the teapots in sun. Um, it would not surprise me at all. Um, so those of you who don't know British tanks, for instance, there is an actual specification on British tanks, and there has been since World War II, that they must contain a water boiler. Uh, and that is so that the tea, <laughs> so that the crew can have a cup of tea, um, <laughs> which uh, always amuses me that British culture has infiltrated so deeply that even in the military, we actually have specifications required, you know, for private companies, defence contract companies, that they must provide these things in order to supply. <laughs> Uh, you know, vehicles designed for the main battlefield. Okay, Zinzan, thanks for dropping in. Take care. So these are the operator chairs for the dipping sonar. And for the sonar operator, or a guy who's actually looking for submarines, interpreting all of those little green blobs on his radar, radar screen, sonar screen. Sonar, radar, same principle, different, um, different form of electromagnetic wave, that's all. Or electromagnetic energy, I should say. There we have that radar screen. I keep calling it a radar because I'm used to aircraft sonar screen. So just as this is drying, again, you probably won't be able to see this with the resolution of the camera and the distance I've got it, but you can see Decal is actually being pulled down as the pledge dries. I have just noticed Although that is working very well, I think I have a little piece of dust, a little speck underneath, which is stopping it. Yes, I do. Okay, I don't know if you can see, you probably won't be able to see that there is a piece of dirt about a millimetre long and about 0.2 millimetres wide, which has managed to work itself underneath the decal. Always there when I put the decal down. So this is one of the reasons it's always good to check on these things, and not just assume that everything will be all right, because it was all right when you put it down. Obviously, as it's drying, it's being pulled down, and then it's just trying to get around that piece of dirt and find it kind of... So, sonar display goes next to dipping sonar in front of the operator. Not much space. It's certainly packed in the stuff. It actually fits pretty tightly in the holes that I've drilled. So not a problem to fix that in. Again, I'm just cementing it in from underneath just to keep any any measure of disturbance free. You can see the decals are starting to, to settle down now there. And then we have most of the interior set up. Now, at this point, I'm not going to put in the main instrument panel, which decals do look like they're settling down quite nicely in there. So not sure I'm going to need any sol or sol equivalent on those but 
the way that this works, because of the way this is designed, which kudos to Airfix, you know, builds up like this, you still have access to this area. So I'm going to leave that at the moment whilst they build up the rest of this around it effectively. So the main thing is just to make sure that you've done everything that you want to do here before moving on, because once you close this up, it does close up, this, this piece comes in, this piece comes in at the end, this piece comes in, and also if I can find it, there's a roof piece as well, which I'll get shortly. That is entirely closed. So how goes the build? It's it's going well. It's um, very easy in terms of you know what Airfix have, have given you. Um, I've only encountered one issue with fit in one step, which I don't know whether it's just my lack of understanding or interpretation of the instructions, but I found it much easier to put two pieces together and then put the piece on that was supposed to go on first. Um, I, I did explain that in the last live build. Uh, but that's the only issue I've actually come across. I and mean, it's not really an issue. Um, it just required a little bit of thought. So yeah, I can't really complain at that. So with all of that, I think it is time to actually close this up. So I'm just going to make sure that I have a decent amount of mating surfaces that are all clean. So I'm just going to make sure this is free of any paint. Just uh, get a little bit of the overspray off. Probably won't make much difference, but just for my peace of mind. Now, this is a bit I've kind of been, not dreading, but a little bit butterflies about, is getting these sides on together with the plastic curtain piece and this rear piece getting all locked in and all squared away properly um, all at the same time. <laughs> so I think what I'm going to do is put this rear on This will basically secure the two side pieces. It will give us a, a stable area to glue to. If I don't get this 100% on at 90 degrees, I think it won't have 100% set. So I can make those slight adjustments if I need to. And I think I'm going to come in with this side first. In, just making sure that these seams have a decent amount of plastic exposed. So you have these nice lips all the way along this piece and around this area to lock on this. So it's a very positive fit. And that's good because you kind of Pull that, because it's quite a flexible floor, because it's so long and narrow. And then that locks onto this rear piece, and you've got three sides of attachment there. So that's a very solid structure, you can see there. So I'm going to work my way back, I think. So start off at this, this top. I'm actually going to glue it from where you won't be able to see when this is built because of course we have the outer fuselage going on here so if I make a mess the place to make it is here <laughs> where people are not going to be able to see it rather than inside the fuselage which okay people might not be able to see especially if you close it up um, but I'm going to keep mine as open as I can and I want as little chance of people see my errors 
as possible. This is how we create the illusion that we are better than we are. It's all smoke and mirrors. <laughs> but at model minutes will tell you that. Right? So actually, I thought there might be a little bit more movement needed to locate this, but actually it's gone together pretty much perfectly. So there was no need for my concern that I was going to F that up. Airfix designed that really nicely. So you may have been wondering earlier why I didn't spray past this point. It's because we've got that um, crash matting separating um, bulkhead piece here. So just putting that in place. And again, that's going to add a bit more strength to this whole structure. So, just to remind you, you might watching last week. We are now we've done all this interior piece that we are going to do. We are now on steps um, 67, 68, and 69. Here, so I actually did them in reverse order. So I did 69 first, and then I'm going to come in with 60. Eight. And the reason I did that is because, again, that is one solid piece that has really good attachment points on here. So you've got you know, that solid side. This one, of course, has the door in it. So it's a little bit less, a little bit less secure, but it's a little bit more awkward. And it is at this point, I realize I haven't actually trimmed the sprue gate areas with my knife. No. Well, I haven't trimmed one of them anyway. So it's at this point that you have that soul crushing piece where you spent all this time in the interior and then you close it all the way. <laughs> so as you can see, uh, look, let's try and get a little bit of light in there so you can see that. Just move this light across. You know, what you can actually see of the interior is pretty limited from there. All that dipping sonar is behind these doors. Not these doors, these windows, sorry. And through the, the door, you can just about see that other set of shells. Yeah, so I think without a pen light to actually kind of shine in there, you're not going to see much in there. But we know it's there, right? That's what counts. So I'm just pre-gluing that piece so that then I can concentrate on these other pieces without having to think about that. So taking those ends and then just coming down on the outside here just to get that fixed in place. So all of that painting, that uh, lovely shading work we did, dry brushing, all gone. <laughs> so yeah, this is why I did this one last, because 
that was just slipping out because it only has that little contact point and you are trying to also make it cement to back here and around there tack that at the top there So much like the Supermarine Spitfire, the 124th scale, uh, where you basically constructed the cockpit, you know, had the cockpit sidewalls as a separate entity, we've done exactly the same thing here with the Sea King. So now we have the Sea King interior, you know, as this little, you know, fits in your hand piece. So we're up to the 70s. Um, there are about 190 steps, 186 steps in the in the build of this. Uh, we're up to 70 on there. You see now we have the show this. We have the fillet to put in at the top here, and also the external windows which in good old British Blue Peter fashion for those of you who don't know that's a children's program where they showed you how to make things and quite often they would be like here's what I made earlier um, I've already cemented these windows in place What's it, windows the, the panels blanking off those windows uh, already Oops, throwing washi tape around for some reason. So this is that fillet we had before. So take that. Okay. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the stream, um, after this, I'm going to be join, joining um, Matt from Model Minutes, um, Plastic Alchemist, Moss, and uh, well, John's going to be there as well. I think Sully, or oh, Body Scale Models, is also going to be there. We're going to be discussing the creator date, oh, LPJ models too. Um, so we're going to be discussing our experiences of the creator day. Well, it wasn't creator day, it was, it was a press day this year. The press day for the release of this kit, the announcement and release, obviously, of this kit. So if you'd like to join us for that, separate stream running after this one. Okay, that is the, the top fillet in place. So you can see the way that this is engineered, again, a lot like the Spitfire and common with other recent Epix molds, that is uh, pretty much flawless in how it fits. Tiny, tiny gap at the front here. Again, you won't see any of that at all. So I'm not concerned about that. I just want to make sure that I've actually got everything aligned properly and that is not my mistake. But it looks good. Barely a seam uh, at, the, at the rear here. And the nice thing about this kind of design as well is you know you can, you can slap in your liquid glue without any fears of any of this you know being seen even if I whack on a load 
put a great big thumbprint in there. It doesn't matter because it's going to be covered. You've also got some nice tabs on this to actually seat down the ceiling fillet. It's quite nice because you can put it together, press it in, make sure you've got really good contact, good adhesion with all these pieces. And as I say, it doesn't matter if you get a, you know, you can go with a little bit of glue on any of this, because of course it's going to be invisible. So one of the things that we will be discussing. Um, I, I certainly want to raise as a point when we're speaking in what, 40 minutes or so is the way that Airfix are approaching their models, the design of their models is very much focused around us as modelers and not just around them as a producer, which I think is the 21st century way to go for our, our humble hobby. So it is about the build experience. So as I mentioned, the Sea King, I'm not a helicopter person. Um, you know, the Sea King doesn't stir my loins with excitement. You know, it isn't a, a Fort Wolf 190 or uh, an experimental, you know, um, 1960s or 2000 aircraft from, from somebody or a what if German Luftwaffe 46 thing kind of things that I would traditionally be like oh that's really nice but building this kit has been a real pleasure and as I mentioned before and in the unboxing video I am like most of us I think almostly a modeler you know I enjoy the experience of building a model all the various different parts of it and the experience of building this certainly so far has been exemplary you know it's it's just been a joy and the scope you know what people could do with this model i think is really really exciting you know, as I say, I'm going to be quite looking forward to seeing some of these at Telford and what people have done with it. So let me have the more or less complete internal subassembly. Yeah, these are settling down really well, these air clips. I think I might just give them a little bit of a a gentle push to the cotton bud. I don't think much more is needed. And again, the nice piece about this is that because this is still open, you know, I can still work on that. And it doesn't really affect you know, the build at all. What you're going to be able to see, you know, is going to make a difference, that decal, certainly. You know, you've got really good detail, really good dial detail and everything on it. So we then put that aside, let those assemblies dry, dry properly, I should say. And whilst that happens, we move to the outer fuselage pieces, and you've got various tasks here. So I'm going to model mine, I think, with, well, certainly with the doors open, and I think probably with the rotors folded, um, mainly for a display size thing i may actually put that up as a vote on the channel 
now to see whether I do it folded or, or fully deployed. Um, it'll end up at the shop anyway, so I'm not too concerned about storage space. Um, but helicopters just the reason that I kind of don't like them as models when they're done is because they've got so many sticky outfits that just catch, you know, on everything. So having it at the shop, if it's in a display case, it'll be fine. Um, otherwise, if it's all folded, it has less chance of being caught um, by somebody's jumper or something. So last time I actually went ahead and did these uh, 76 through to 79. So that is this assembly, the exhaust assembly here. That actually sits on this little slot on top here. Um, and it tells you not to cement that, so I won't. It just sits there. Also gives you an idea of how small the gnome engines are, the power of the Sea King, or power of the Sea King, because obviously there's quite, st quite a lot still flying. You know, they aren't that big, considering the size of the aircraft, you know. They're pushing out a fair bit of horsepower, but just amazing how small they are. Really. Anywho, uh, we want piece G20. Now, I would definitely say sprue management is something that you need to consider when you are making this kit because either you end up with huge frames with nothing on them, you know, which are really, un well, really cumbersome, I will say, or you end up cutting them down like I do. So this is my current frame F. Um, but of course, if you're doing that and you don't have the lettering on them, you quickly find that you don't know what it is. I have no issue doing that on pieces like this, um, because this is just much easier to, to manage, less chance of it catching on something or another part catching on it. You've got some quite small parts that I'll show you on here. Uh, you can just get something backing on there. Oh, got some tissue. See how fine these parts here are. Now, if I had a big sprue knocking about with these pieces sort of coming out, or ones that come up and like a hook, it's quite easy to hook these and break them. So that's one of the reasons I cut my sprues down um, whilst I'm actually building. That, and I also do quite like just cutting sprues. I find it quite therapeutic. Maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm just weird. I don't know. Um, let's see. Well, sprue G was quite a small one. It's not this one. <laughs> That's actually sprue A. It has the stairs on there. So obviously, even though I've got the, the D still on this, quite obvious which sprue this is because it's got the rotor blades on. So we're not going to mistake that one. Uh, sprue E. Sprue B. Oh, <laughs> now <laughs> this is what comes from doing live streams and not thinking about what you're doing. So I've already done this piece. <laughs> That's why I can't find it. So that is piece G20 already cemented in place. Ah, dear. So we move quite rapidly at this point um, in terms of building up the, the sort of body of the uh, helicopter. Because now that we have this, we quite rapidly come to actually putting all of this in in place. Now I'm actually not going to do that right now and one of the reasons is 
because I have not sprayed the interior of this. But you can see how this is going to, to all set up. See that fits in really quite nicely. Sort of clicks in place. And you can see the engineering again here, how well the alignment of this, even though this isn't glued, that just fits perfectly with just like a tiny um, clearance around it, as in the real thing. Let's just dry fit this piece in. There we go. The bottom comes in. These locating pieces. So this is for the A version for the 1970s HAS1. These are these pieces that you have to fill. So, uh, and here on the front as well. So you have a very smooth kind of airframe on the HAS1. And then you start getting all these bumps and things on um, the subsequent builds. So you've got pieces to carve off here and then fill. So especially if you're doing the HAS1, if you can imagine this with raised rivets. So this is where I just filled this with sprue goo and just kind of shaping it to the profile of the hobby knife. So to restore a set of 0.1 millimeter high rivets, if they were raised, would be unpleasant, let's say. Uh, restoring a row of recessed rivets, so along here, is a much easier process. Even if I was to use a micro drill and do each one individually, I've got what? Maybe one, two, three, four, five, six. So 12 to do there. And what may be, say, three times that. So, say 30, 30, 40 rivets to restore. Um, I can't imagine restoring 40, 30 or 40 raised rivets or something like this. That would be horrific. So, I definitely think the recessed rivets was a good idea. And again, this comes back to what I was saying before about Airfix thinking about us as modelers, what we have to do. Now, if you really want raised rivets, there would be nothing stopping you getting very small styling rod and gluing it into each of these <laughs> holes to create those rivets. If that's your thing, if it means that much to you, you know, knock yourself out. I think you'd be crazy. Um, because again, as I mentioned last time, we're not trying to recreate a seeking, you know, in absolute authentic detail. The skin of this seeking is not the same scale thickness as an actual seeking because it would crumple in your hands if you did that because material strength isn't the same. Um, so we're trying to recreate the illusion of that. And again, the recessed rivets um, were the right choice for that. Uh, just looking here, actually, what will be visible through here? It's not. It's not too bad. You, know, you can see a decent way in from from there, and you can see the operator and the radar screen from here. Uh, you can't really see the dipping sonar at all. Um, you can just see it through this window. 
you could almost get away with taking the dipping sonar out and displaying it separately but <laughs> nobody would be the wiser <laughs> but we have made our choice we'll stick to it so leaving that aside i'm actually going to skip forward this is our, our little chin piece by the way so we've got the two lights here this is a clear piece piece x21 that goes in there uh, also the instructions do remind you if you've forgotten for the a version to fill these it tells you up front right at the beginning of the instructions again mention that in the unboxing but if you have forgotten that and you get to this point it does very obviously say that you've got to take off these two lugs and fill them now if I were to make a criticism of this kit or a piece where I think, hmm, I wonder why they didn't do that, it would be in these pieces, in these areas on the bottom where you have to fill, you have to cut off and fill these pieces. So personally, and I'm not going to try and second guess Airfix too much because they have been doing if, um, model production a lot longer than I have been modeling. Personally, I would have liked it if this was uh, just a, a single piece with all the piece molded in without those little bits coming off and the same here. And then the same sort of system that they used for the lower fuselage where you have a piece of washi tape again. Um, where you have these grooves and little dots to tell you where to drill. I would have much preferred it if they had done a similar thing here and had drilling places um, here. So that if you were doing the later models, you drilled the holes and then put, you know, glued the pieces on rather than having to take off uh, pieces, especially on this complex curve here. Although that actually was probably easier than this area, which is flat. So you are, and there are some raised pieces here, which you have to be careful that you don't cut off. So I'm not sure why that choice was made. I'm sure there was a good reason for it. Obviously, I'm not party to, to that or that decision. But that's what I would have, I think, would have been a better experience from a modeling point of view, is not having to do, I think if you have to carve pieces off the model, there was always the chance to have um, modeled it in a different way, tooled it in a different way. Um, it wouldn't have increased part count enormously. You know, maybe you got four, four extra parts. So not quite sure why that was done. And that's what I would personally say would be a, an improvement. But it's not the end of the world. You know, it affects one version um, for this. And I get they wanted the maximum versatility. But... Anyway, other side. Um, let us skip forward. Um, so we've already done steps 92. Or step 92, I should say, which is this at uh, the air intakes. Again, this is going to just show you how small those gnome engines are that, uh, that go there. So, I mean, that can only be what? Four scale feet, five scale feet, or something like that? That's not a lot. Quite amazing. Uh, so, already done that step. The other pieces here are to do with the fuselage. So, again, I'm going to leave that until I've sprayed the interior. And again, some more fuselage pieces. So, this is another piece where you you have to carve off and then sand on piece A9, the spine here. The spine which has obviously the, the drive shaft or the tail rotor. Uh, and actually you have to do that for three versions. So for, for A, B and C, you've got to carve off this piece and then for A you take off that little um, fin as well.
However, skipping forward, I'm going to the uh, pods for the landing gear. So we start at step 99. And primarily, we are dealing with sprue E here. So one of the things as well that FX uh, talked about is placement of things on sprues. Um, it used to be done very much that they place things where they worked, <laughs> to the limitations of their technology. And now it's very much, you know, they don't necessarily want a modeler to be going from, you know, sprue E to sprue A to sprue C to sprue. So if you can see here, we've got E, 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 E. E, 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 we've got X because obviously it's a clear piece. And then these are all E's, these are E's, these are E's, these are sub-assemblies, these are E's, these are E's. So the whole of that landing gear section is all on one sprue. So it's not until you make the decision of whether you want the landing gear down or up you actually have to start thinking about other pieces. So then you actually incorporate sprue A, the, the main landing gear is still E, but the wheels are E's, uh, are A's, sorry, rather than E's. So, you know, you can do entire sub-assemblies without coming away from a single sprue. Yeah, just while I'm here, actually, here is <laughs> yeah, I'm just reciting letters of the alphabet. <laughs> um, here's that little piece here that you have to carve off, and that little sub um, aerial there. So, yeah, I think it would have been nicer for this to just have a little hole, or again, to be drilled a hole from the other side to add that if you were going to use it. But again, not a not a real major point, not a breaking point at all. So going back to ninety nine, uh, we need E thirty eight, which is the floor of the wheel well, the little pod, the rotation pod. So we need E thirty. Uh, sorry, only 33. And these are handed. So, um, again, I won't show it on this because it won't show up with the, uh, the resolution of StreamYard and the compression from YouTube. There is extra detail on part 34 that there isn't on part 33, you know, which is one exceptional in terms of attention to detail because how many people are going to notice that you know this is the inside of a wheel well which is going to be invisible to 99.9 percent .9 of viewers of this even if you have a mirror underneath your seek are you going to spot that I, I would doubt you would spot that even if you picked the damn thing up and looked at it um so it obviously makes a difference, is what I'm saying. You do need part E33, you can't just interchange them. So they just you need to pay attention to things like that. Sometimes I don't. Uh, we need piece E30, which is uh, this one. And piece E29. And then, of course, we do the same thing for the, the other pod. Bear with me when I just replace the battery on my main camera.
So has anybody in the chat actually uh, pre-ordered the Seeking? Or are you all waiting to see how it builds up or when it's in the shops? So I tried to cut these uh, sprue gates a little long, even though I have uh, single bladed cutters. Sometimes with single bladed cutters, if you don't get the exact alignment right and you're cutting right up, you can actually cut into the styrene a little bit. So cutting it long and then trimming it back is the safer alternative. Probably actually doesn't really matter in this because these are internal assemblies that you're not going to see anyway. But it's just a matter of practice, getting into good habits. Which is challenging because I picked up many bad habits in modeling over the years. So in case of do as I say, not as I do, but sometimes I will do things that I wouldn't recommend. Like now, cutting towards my thumb. As I mentioned on the last live stream, I find it much easier to control a blade over small distances cutting towards myself than away. So for me, I feel it's safer for me. And if I do make a mistake, you know, it's my choice. I'm just going to get a, uh, an injury on my thumb. Well, taggers, 40. That's that's not a stash. Until you're getting into triple figures, it's not a stash. <laughs> that's uh, that's my my reasoning. <laughs> yeah, I think as, as a first as a first helicopter, I think this is probably a good one. I mean, obviously, it's going to be. It's not just a, a very simple build. It's a 48th aircraft, so it's uh, substantial. There's a lot of parts, but as I mentioned before, I've had no issues in actually building this going all the way through. I mean, look at that. So that part E33 going into part E38, that is actually snug enough. I'm not. There's no cement on that. That is just a push fit, friction fit. I just find the engineering level that Airfix have, have got now, the tolerances that they're able to produce are superb. And let's face it, it hasn't always been the case. Um, I really do feel they turned a big corner with uh, Hornby's ownership. And Bill, you already pre-ordered, excellent. I ordered a couple for the shop. So I put in a big airfix order uh, on Friday for the shop, including a couple of Seekings. So I should get my account all set up this week uh, to get Tamiya. So I we'll have a full range of Tamiya acrylics. I'll be taking the outlaw paints. So I'll have outlaw lacquer paints. So I'll have full range of Tamiya. I've got uh, some AK interactive sets and Vallejo. Well, stash size is always bigger than the number of finished kits I find. <laughs> I think I am pushing 700 now as a stash, which is ludicrous. And uh, probably a problem, probably something pathological there. Okay, so that's the first little wheel well assembly. As you can see, you know, very, very simple to build up. You know, that, that's the kind of standard of building throughout this kit. You know, the, the pieces are engineered very well, you know, it's assembly 
you know, little more than that. Of course, there's an argument about, uh, or an argument in some circles about assembly versus modeling. Um, I would prefer most of the kit to be assembly. Uh, and then the modeling, the skill kind of comes through in what else, what's the value add that you're putting to it? You know, how can you differentiate your kit from others if you want to, you know? Um, I'm just doing this as a straight out of the box build because I think that's the best way to represent a new kit from a manufacturer rather than adding to it. Uh, so I'm actually gonna go ahead and piece E18 now. I need the side with the numbering, otherwise I can't tell which is which, which is this one. So rather than creating a second assembly, which looks identical to the first, I'm going to embed it into the pod so I can't fuck it up later. Ah, the FX Tempest 5. That was the first of what I would call the new Airfix kits that I picked up last year. That was my first exposure to the current Airfix. And it's a lovely little kit. Which I also haven't yet built. <laughs> okay, so that is... Um, Part E18, we take our sub-assembly from 101. So you have little locating lines in here. You've also got this little cutout. You see there? And you've got this piece here, which goes into that. So there's no ambiguity about how this fits together, which is good because it is quite a pronounced angle. But again, You'll be able to see it on the. Uh, would be able to see it. Oh, no. I think I just made a mistake. Is that recording or not? Okay. I haven't been recording any of that. Fortunately, there's two pods, so I get to do it again. So, as you'll be able to see on the main build video when it comes out. So just putting this in, there is basically no gap. It just fits in there. Again, there's no cement on this piece at the moment. Really, really nice the way it fits together. But yeah, uh, as I was saying, I think there is definitely, you know, I'm not against anybody doing any type of model. I think modeling is whatever you want to make it. Uh, but if I want to challenge myself, you know, with a particularly challenging build, then, you know, I'll buy an old kit, do that. I am needed elsewhere. Ah, well, I know that uh, we have Airfix to chill in 10 minutes, so I will be ending the stream a little earlier uh, than the prior one, so in about five minutes. So once I get this pod together, I shall probably uh, call it a day there. But yeah, this does not give you those challenges. And by challenges, I mean issues, you know. I think... Part of the modeling journey is to learn the skills to be able to deal with issues that you come across. But I think the lack of issues in a kit is not something that we should complain about, you know, should be thankful for. Um, so we can then go to kits which are maybe older or are known to have issues and use those skills that we've developed along the way to actually do that. You know, but that should be our choice. We shouldn't have to be forced to do that because that's all that's available.
Okay, so part E20. So it's good that I took this part all the way through to its conclusion because the other one has that transparency in, which would mean I wouldn't actually be able to complete it right now. So I'll put this together. And we'll probably end it there. But as uh, John has thankfully reminded there, thank you, John. Um, we'll be going across to Airfix and Chill now. That is available uh, on the channel as well. So you don't have to go far. It's just uh, a separate stream. And there you see. There is the completed pod. Well, not completed, but uh, closed up pod, should we say. Like so. So I can only say that FX have done a fantastic job on the engineering of this kit. You know, there is, uh, barring errors, <laughs> I think it should go together pretty flawlessly. Some really nice race detail as well on these panels. So. Okay, I think we call it a day at that. I shall thank all of you for uh, for attending this next build piece and getting us to not quite to this piece. Um, I shall probably spray these pieces, um, let's say, off camera. Um, for the next live stream so that we can actually get to building the main hull assembly and getting all of the, the landing pods and everything so it will come together so maybe one or two more of these live sessions i'll probably do should take us through to the end of this build i want to get this out fairly quickly um so that you guys can have a, a proper in-depth look and look at the high quality footage rather than through the um the stream yard and um youtube compressed version which i appreciate can't give you that detail but thank you guys for your time um please do if you've got the time come and join us on ethics and chill next and we're going to talk about the creator day press day youtube day whatever you want to call it and uh, a little bit about the behind the scenes uh, that we all saw and uh, share some of that and our thoughts with you all so thanks everybody and uh, have a great day <laughs>